The idea of a death drive or an innate desire for destruction is most commonly associated with Sigmund Freud, and for good reason, as we'll see. But before we even start with Freud, we need to talk about three other psychoanalysts who were instrumental in the formulation of this idea. Wilhelm Steckel, Alfred Adler, and Sabina Spielrein. They were all students of Freud and separately laid down the groundwork for the idea that would one day become known as the death drive. Wilhelm Steckel was one of Freud's earliest followers. He often focused on the darker aspects of the human psyche in his work and he was particularly interested in understanding the unconscious motivations behind various forms of self-destructive behavior. He theorized that such behaviors could be traced back to subconscious drives and impulses, including a desire for the organism to return to a state of non-existence. He was the first one to use the term thanatos, to describe an innate force within us that seeks destruction, as opposed to Freud's idea of the eros, which is the force within us that seeks pleasure, procreation and preservation. Now coming to Alfred Adler, who was one of Freud's most prolific followers turned greatest intellectual hater. If you've ever used the term inferiority complex, you've referenced his work. Adler focused on the aggressive drives within humans in their pursuit of power and this influenced Freud's shift of focus, although he hated to admit it, into the darker aspects of human drives. And finally, the most key and historically most overlooked contributor to the idea of the death drive was Sabina Spielrein. Sabina was a Russian psychoanalyst, one of the first female psychoanalysts and a significant figure in the early stages of psychoanalysis. In her extremely metal-sounding paper, Destruction as the Cause of Coming into Being, Spielrein proposed that destruction is an essential and inevitable force in psychological development and transformation. She argued that destruction and creation are intimately linked, suggesting that the drive towards destruction is not solely negative, but also a necessary precursor to new creation and development. Now, all these ideas were floating around him, but the stubborn Mr. Freud was either too dismissive, as he often was, or evasive in his appreciation. But then, something happened that transformed his perspective. World War I broke out. At an analytical level, Freud noticed that soldiers would not only relive their traumatic experiences from the war in dreams, they would also be subconsciously drawn to circumstances that reminded them of their trauma, almost as if they wanted to be pulled back into the battlefield. This ran contrary to Freud's famous idea of the life instinct or eros. This was a strong pull in the opposite direction, towards danger and death. He could no longer deny that it was grossly insufficient to say that human behavior is primarily driven by the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. There was clearly something much darker at play. Emotionally, there was potentially another reason for Freud's turn to the darker side of human instinct. He was in pain. His sons Ernest and Martin were soldiers in the war and his family was under great stress. During this time, Freud wrote, I venture, under the impact of the war, to remind you that the evil impulses of mankind have not vanished in any of its individual members. Our intellect is a feeble and dependent thing, a plaything, and a tool of our instincts and affects. And a few years later, Freud's favorite child, Sophie, dies of the Spanish flu. Freud was heartbroken but also deeply guilty that his daughter had died while he was still alive. He found this state of affairs to be monstrous, unbearable. And then, in this intellectual and emotional context, came the essay that would change psychoanalysis forever, beyond the pleasure principle. In this essay, Freud introduces the concept of the death drive as we know it today, challenging his own monodirectional view that human behavior is primarily driven by the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. For Freud, the death drive is an instinct within humans that compels them towards self-destruction and a return to an inorganic, non-living state where you don't have to do anything anymore. And just like that, Freud burns the dried husk of his own theory and brings forth a new paradigm. 
a dualistic picture of the psyche now emerges in his writing. The two instincts, the death instinct and the life instinct, in constant interplay within the human psyche, driving behavior and influencing mood and motivation. He now began to see even the drive towards pleasure as nested within a death drive and as a counterforce to it. The death drive is characterized by behaviors that may appear irrational or self-destructive such as a compulsion to repeat traumatic events, the impulse to sabotage your own happiness and the secret desire to withdraw back into the familiar comfort of something that's terrible for you. In other words, the organism struggles against events that might expedite its own good, its own life-affirming aims. According to the classical Freudian stance, the death drive can manifest as external behaviors such as sudden aggression or risky behavior, addictive patterns and compulsively seeking out traumatic experiences and circumstances. But all too often, it shows up as extreme inaction or withdrawal from participating in life and activities or squandering away chances to feel connected to life, your goals and the people around you. On one hand, life's call to adventure is confused with the impulse to jump headfirst into the void. On the other hand, life's call to adventure is refused out of the fear of the vital unknown and in favor of the familiar rut. Opportunities are perceived subconsciously as dangers, commitments are perceived as condemnations. The dark cold comfort of inertia feels more inviting than the light to which we are not yet accustomed. When Freud published his idea of the death drive, it was immediately accepted by everyone and it wasn't controversial at all. Kidding. Despite a few important supporters down the line like Melanie Klein and Eric Byrne, Freud's theory was met with skepticism and criticism which only mounted as psychoanalysis declined and modern clinical and experimental psychology ascended. The empirical basis of the death drive was questioned and its status as a universal drive behind human behaviors was debated down, relegated to the tiniest silos of applicability. And just like with pretty much everything Freud ever proposed, we've torn the idea of the death drive to shreds, finding a teeny bit of validity in some discrete areas of study and leaving just large gaping holes and limitations. In our wake. But I think there's something incredibly valuable in there that's been thrown away with the bathwater and it feels like it's come back to haunt us. The millennial obsession with memes about death and decay, jokes about being in rotting errors and the socially mediated narrative amongst young people of being mere pawns in forces beyond our control all the time so what's the point? All these may be clues that there is an ongoing resurgence and preoccupation with death-like inertia. And I think we need better symbols to help us psychologically organize and make sense of the desire for this inertia. I don't care very much about whether the death drive is an immutable universal psychological principle or not. I care about whether we can use it as a symbolic marker to identify and understand the self-sabotaging behaviors that we unwittingly participate in. And I really care about using this understanding of our darker impulses to mitigate their damage and move forward in life with confidence. And indeed, Freud himself didn't think of the death drive as an actual desire to experience death. In fact, he thought that since the state of non-being could not be truly experienced, it's not death itself, but what death symbolically represents in the unconscious mind that was at the core of the death drive. And what is one of the things death symbolically represents, perhaps more than anything else? A state of complete inactivity and non-participation. From this perspective, I think the death drive is an excellent conceptual tool to make sense of that impulse we have from time to time to relinquish conscious creative control over our own lives. Specifically, it's useful to make sense of the death drive as a cyclical temptation to give up our own self-authorship rights and responsibilities. So what do I mean by self-authorship? Coined by the developmental psychologist Robert Keegan, self-authorship is the conscious effort to feel like you are the author of your own life's narrative by making deliberate choices and taking actions that align with your values, goals and aspirations. And doing this for long enough that your values, goals and aspirations take on a sort of identity in themselves. 
becoming an internal guiding light that helps inform your choices and actions. Integral to self-authorship is a continuous process of self-directed reflection, decision-making and action, which slowly builds a long-term vision of who you want to be. In this framework, the death drive acts as a counter-narrative to self-authorship, representing an underlying pull towards passivity, inaction, pessimism, shame of success, and ultimately the desire to surrender authorship rights over your life story to these feelings. This manifests in behaviors that undermine self-authorship, such as self-sabotage, chronic procrastination, avoidance of challenging but necessary tasks, and a general reluctance to step out of one's comfort zone. It is a temptation to surrender to a force that opposes the self-directed momentum of life. In every life, there is an inherent narrative tension between comfort and growth, between ease and effort, and consciously choosing to steer your life towards meaningful objectives and values or not. This choice is not a one and done type of deal. It's a continuous process of negotiating with and overcoming the pull of the metaphorical death drive again and again. Embracing self-authorship means acknowledging that while we may not have control over many aspects of our lives, we do have control over how we respond to life's challenges. It's about moving away from a victim mentality which frames you as the unwilling hostage to life to a self-authorship mindset where life is something we can actively shape and influence. In doing so, we counteract the death drives narrative of passivity and surrender. Instead, we choose a path of active engagement and purposeful direction.